So welcome. Uh, my name is Roger Berkowitz. I'm the founder and director of the Hunter Rent Center, and I'm thrilled to have you guys here at Bard College for this talk tonight with Ken Malik. Um, Ken is here from London. Uh, he's on a book tour uh, around the United States. I love the idea of a transatlantic book tour. So it's a great idea. Um, and his new book is Not So Black and White. Uh, it's an ambitious book, like a lot of what he writes, uh, that seeks to retell the history of the idea of race uh, and of the struggle to confront racism. Uh, Kennan is a prolific uh, writer and uh, producer of, of what they now call content. He's a writer, lecturer, and broadcaster for radio, TV, and makes radio and TV documentaries, including Disunited Kingdom and Our Muslims Hated. Uh, he's the author of The Quest for a Moral, Moral Compass, A Global History of Ethics, and a book that has done very well and has been reissued in a special edition just in 2017 and won the Orwell Prize from Fatwa to Jihad, How the World Changed from the Satanic Verses to Charlie Hebdo. Um, even though his website's not up to date, I do like uh, his, his, his account of himself on the website where he says, politically, I take my cue from James Baldwin's insistence that freedom is not something that anybody can be given. Freedom is something people take. Thrilled to have you here, Ken, and look forward to your talk. Thanks, Roger. Um, about that. <laughs> well, thanks to Roger and, and to Bard for, for inviting me here. In fact, I was here, almost here, about five years ago. So it didn't quite happen. I was almost here about two weeks ago. That didn't quite right. happen, so it's nice to be here at last. Um, let me begin with a, with a quote from Franz Fanon from his 1952 work, um, Black Skins, Black Masks. The Negro is not any more than the white man. Fanon was making an argument about the illusory character of racial categorization. Can you hear me, by the way? My ears are still kind of pinging from the yeah, from the here. flight, so yeah, okay. So I can't, can't tell the level of my voice. Okay, that's fine. Um, Fanon was making an argument about the illusory character of racial categorization. And yet, more than 70 years ago, no, 70 years after he wrote those lines, they still feel unsettling, as if they're a challenge not just to racialization, but to our identity, our very being. The Negro is not any more than the white man. And that they should feel unsettling, it seems to me, to expose the deeply conflicted relationship we still have um, with the idea of race. And to try and unravel some of, some of the issues here, I want to first sketch out briefly the changing conceptions of the idea of race over the past two centuries. And then even more briefly, I'm, I'm only going to talk about 20 minutes, so it'll be, it'll be very brief, even more briefly, the the, the changing character of anti-racism and the struggle against the cat racial categorization. And finally, a few observations about contemporary anti-racism and the politics of identity. And in doing so, I hope to question some of the ways in which we think of all three. Let's begin with the idea of race as a modern concept. Modern not because prejudice and prejudice categorization of human groups were not deeply rooted in the uh, pre-modern world. They were, they were integral to it. But paradoxically, in a sense, that's why concepts of race in the modern world are so different from ideas of uh, ideas about group differences in the, the pre-modern world. Modern because only the world in which the principles of social equality and of a common humanity have become accepted. Can ideas of racial inequality acquire real meaning? And that was the world slowly coming to being in 18th century Europe, in particular, uh, to the Enlightenment. Now, there's no period of history that's more uh, contested than the Enlightenment. Uh, so it's the foundation of the uh, modern ideas of liberty and equality for others, the source of racism and bigotry. But the Enlightenment was not a singular blob, 
cut through, but cut through with conflicts and contradictions. It was an age in which ideas about equality and a common human nature became widely accepted and became influential in, in, the, in, in the ways in which we think about ourselves and our relationship to others. It was also an age of colonialism and slavery. And many Enlightenment philosophers combined a defense of the liberty and equality with racist attitudes, maybe an acceptance of slavery. And here are the beginnings of a, of a contradiction that would shape the modern world between societies that define themselves through an abstract commitment to equality, such as the French Declaration of the Rights of Man or the American Declaration of Independence, and social practices that deny such equality to the majority of people. The divisions that rent the post-enlightened world both within Europe and between Europeans and non-Europeans, would have seemed unremarkable <coughs> in the pre-modern world. But in societies that now define themselves by their attachment, their foundational attachment to, them, to equality and liberty, these inequalities and injustices posed fundamental problems. And race became a means of bridging that contradiction by insisting that certain people were by nature unequal and not deserving of liberty and equality. There's a common assumption that racism emerges when members of one race begin discriminating against members of another, that racism is what happens when races collide. But I turn the argument on its head Race did not give birth to racism. Racism gave birth to race. The ancestors of today's African Americans weren't enslaved because they were black. They became classified as a distinct and an inferior race as a means of justifying their enslavement in a society that had proclaimed a foundational belief in the equality of human beings. And this, the response to this contradiction became a central divide within the Enlightenment, most notably between what many historians now call the mainstream and the radicals. The mainstream Enlightenment consists of figures with whom we're most familiar, Locke, Voltaire, Jefferson, and so on. They attempted to reconcile abstract belief in social practice by making universalism less universal. Only certain people, they argue, usually white, male, middle class, were worthy of equality and liberty. The radicals, the lesser known figures such as Diderot, Goldbach, and Spinoza, were intransigently hostile to slave to racism, to slavery, to colonialism, and insisted that liberty and equality were the prerogative of all, not the privilege of a civilised few. And the struggle between these two forms of universalism, between what I call, or what I call, the liberal and the radical forms of universalism, was key in shaping the character of the Enlightenment and in framing subsequent debates about race and colonialism. I haven't got time to, to deal with it now, we can talk about it later, but, but if you look at the, the, the debate between liberal, which is John Stuart Mill, kind of the lowest of Victorian liberalism, and his attitude to colonialism. He was a member, a, 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 an employee of the East India Company, to defend the British colonialism. Um, and that of um, the radicals, the working class radicals, they're very different. Um, and, and their whole approach to colonialism and the idea of equality and liberty were, even though both considered themselves universally, were very different concepts of what universalism meant. There's another way in which the, the way that we think about race is very different from the way that 19th century thinkers think about race. We think about race primarily in terms of skin colour or continent of origin, black, white, Asian, and so on. 
19th century perceptions were very different. He certainly thought about um, uh, divisions in terms of skin color and, and, and colony of origin. But races to them was not just a question of skin color, but also of social differences. It may be difficult to comprehend now, but for 19th century thinkers, the working class was as racially distinct from the middle class as many now see blacks and whites as racially distinct. So a London newspaper, the Saturday Review, wrote a, a, a long piece, it's a long piece about um, the life of the Bethel Green poor. And for those of you who don't know, Bethel Green is in East London's the heart of the working class community. It's now the heart of the Bangladeshi community. And he wrote to the Bethel Green poor as a race of whom we know nothing, adding that the separation of English classes was little different from the, than from the separation of slaves from whites. Now these were not metaphors or analogies. The working class and the rural poor were really seen as being physically, anthropologically distinct, racially distinct. And even in America, for, for all the centrality of slavery to the perceptions of race. The idea of class as a racial division was deeply embedded. So someone like Lester Ward, who's the first president of the American Sociological Association, he argued that the genesis of, and I'm quoting, the genesis of society has been through a struggle of races. The conquering race looks down with contempt upon the conquered race and compels it to serve it in various ways. And this, for Ward, was the, was the origins of social class. Concepts of race as we understand it emerged only in the early decades of the 20th century, propelled by two developments, the coming of democracy at home, which made it much more difficult to express uh, racialized ideas about uh, working class people when you're trying to get their votes. Um, and a new imperialism exemplified by the scramble for Africa. Um, so there was a scramble for much beyond Africa too. But the Pacifics was, um, was parceled up as well um, in that period. And in the coincidence of democracy and imperialism, the language of race became refocused more exclusively on skin color. And whiteness, which had been um, con a deeply contested notion in the 19th century, contested in the sense of uh, a, a, a debate, a big debate about who was white and who wasn't. Um, uh, and if you look at the, the descriptions of uh, East Europeans and the South Europe, some Europeans, um, uh, migrants, um, coming to America, um, it's pretty extraordinary the language used um, to describe as the Caliban type by Edward Ross, who was a, another uh, sociological professor at Cornell and Harvard. Um, I'm, not trying, I'm not trying to suggest that the treatment of African Americans say was, was the same, um, was of the same um, latitude as, as the treatment of East European migrants or Southern European migrants. I am trying to say that the, that the idea of race, the concept of race, and of whiteness is far more complex um, than we now imagine it to be. And there's a real his, a historical amnesia about the way we think about race and whiteness today. And as much of this history of race has been forgotten, so too is much of the history of the challenge to racism. Until relatively recently, radicals confronting inequality and oppression did so in the name not of particular identity, but of a universalism that fueled the, the great radical movements that have shaped the modern world, uh, from anti-colonial struggles to the movement for women's suffrage to the battles for gay rights. That universalism was perhaps best expressed in the Haitian Revolution in 1791, which revealed both the necessity for and the shortcomings of enlightened ideas. 
it's one of the three great revolutions of the, of the 18th century that compared to the place that the American and the French revolutions have in our culture, it is barely remembered. And yet, it was through the Haitian Revolution, the insurrection of slaves in the French colony of Saint-Domingue, that led eventually to the formation of a, of a new um, nation state, Haiti. That the emancipatory logic of um, Enlightenment universalism was mu pushed much further than many Enlightenment thinkers desired or intended. The French revolutionists who seized power in 1789 did so in the name of the rights of man. But they deliberately, self-consciously, by edict of the National Assembly, refused to apply those rules, uh, those rights, to the colonists because they wanted to preserve the, the, the lucrative uh, uh, profits coming from places like saint Denis, which at that time was the most profitable uh, colony in the world uh, because of the sugar plantations rather than on slavery. And it was the 12 year long Haitian Revolution that transformed the meaning of universal rights. It forced the French to abolish slavery, um, even if temporarily um, Napoleon brought it back uh, six, seven years later. In a way, the, the insurrectionists forced the French Revolution to take seriously, for the first time, their own revolutionary ideals. And in a debate about the Enlightenment, supporters and critics present it as a peculiarly European phenomenon. For one, it's a demonstration of Europe's greatness. For another, a reminder that its ideals are tainted with racism and colonialism. Both, I think, miss the importance of the non-European world and of the non-elites within Europe in shaping many of the ideals we associate with the environment. It was through the struggles of those denied equality and liberty by the elites of Europe and America that the ideas of universalism were truly invested with meaning. However, from the earliest days of resistance to racism and colonialism, there were also movements rooted not in universalist perspectives, but in racial identitarian movements, from the Back to Africa movement in the, in the 19th century to Garvey's and Pan Africanism and Negritude in the 20th. We often think about contemporary identity politics as something that has suddenly erupted on the scene, it hasn't. Rather, identitarian strikes, which have long been part of the, the anti-racist, anti-colonial movements, but, but always relatively marginal, and, and usually seen as reactionary, have become increasingly dominant. The question we, we, we need to address is not why has um, identity politics suddenly erupted, but why have these strands become dominant in a way they never were for the past 200 years? And there are many reasons. I don't have the time to, 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 to explore all of them, but perhaps the most important has been what I'd call the intensification of social pessimism. Radical universalism that I've never been talking about, was rooted in the belief that it was possible to build mo mo moments, movements of solidarity that could radically transform society. Much of that belief has ebbed away over the past half century. The, the breakdown of the Kenton post-order order, the emergence of what many now call neoliberalism, has been accompanied also by the disintegration of the old liberation movements in the global south and, and, and the kind of ideologies that, 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 um, in which thoughts were expressed. And by the disintegration of um, labor movements and trade unions in Europe and America. And as the possibilities of radical social transformation has eroded, many of these are led to cling ever more fiercely to their own identities as places of refuge and as political markets. 
And at the same time, the demise of the radical universalist tradition has led many, has made it easier to condemn universalism as mere liberal duplicity. And the Enlightenment is a form of white philosophy. And the complexities in the history, both of the Enlightenment and of the movements for liberation and social justice, and the importance of universalist ideas to those movements, have often been lost. And that has inevitably shaped the, the character of anti-racism. Take something like critical race theory. There have been all manner of criticism, some valuable, a lot uh, bloody awful and reactionary. What most miss out, I think, though, is the understanding of critical race theory as the product of that social pessimistic outlook. We can see this most clearly in a a figure like Derek Bell. Uh, I don't know if you know about Bell, he's kind of one of the significant founders of uh, critical race theory, hugely influential on people from Michel Alexander to Barack Obama, though largely unknown to us to the wider public. He was a key figure in the civil rights movement, um, uh, helping desegregate schools in the South. And it became disillusioned by a lack of progress in enforcing desegregation. And he came to see racism, in his own words, as permanent and indestructible. Black people, he wrote, would never gain full equality. And to accept that, and not to accept that, was to inflict on ourselves great mental harm. Now, few inspired by Bell's work have tumbled as far down the into, into the well of existential despair as he did. But that sense of pessimism about the, the ineradicability of racism that was at the heart of his work has nevertheless shaped much of contemporary thinking about race. So take a figure like um, Tanacy Coates. He writes in between the world and me, that racism is like a natural disaster, like an earthquake or, or a typhoon. And just as earthquakes and typhoons cannot be stopped by law or social movements, neither of them can racism. And if racism is permanent, then anti-racism completely changes its character. It becomes reduced a little more than a kind of public performance of finger wagging at white people. Social pessimism, it seems to me, has prompted a shift from campaigns for material change to demands for symbolic justice and representational fairness, or at best, a, a, an attempt to make the unfairness a little less unfair. Or take a movement like Black Lives Matter, some people see it as the, as the expression of um, the reawakening of, of um, black radicalism, of, of race consciousness. Others see it as a betrayal of um, 1960s civil rights movement. It seems to me that, that it's neither. But what it gives voice to is that tension between radicalism and essential between a view of anti-racism in terms of a radical universalist perspective and a view of anti-racism in terms of a, a race conscious perspective. A key Black Lives Matter statement of belief reads, we see ourselves as part of a global black family. The trouble is, the global black family is a confected unity that serves only to obscure divisions within black communities and makes the creation of solidarity across racial lines more difficult. A good illustration is a, is a, a sanitation worker strike in New Orleans in 2020. In May of that year, sanitation workers walked out on strike because of poverty wages, a lack of safety equipment, this was the middle of the pandemic, uh, and a refusal uh, uh, to allow unions into, into, into the workplace. Virtually all the workers were black. 
so were the employers. Because the city had outsourced sanitation work to a black owned company as part of it, as I said, an anti racist gesture. The workers came out on strike three weeks before George Floyd was murdered. The murder that energized a, a global movement behind the banner of Black Lives Matter. They were on strike throughout that summer, um, that summer of um, protest and, and demonstrations right across the world, uh, conversations about, about black rights, uh, in denial of black rights, and about uh, anti racism. They were forced back to work in September, that September, having won virtually none of their demands. The black employers won, the black workers lost. Black Lives Matter had very different meanings on the two sides of the picket line, on the two sides of the class divide. It's a reminder that to assume that there exists a common set of interests or an identity that binds together all black people, or all Asians, or all Muslims, or all whites is to reinforce the power of the elite within any community and to diminish the voices of those with least power. The other side of the, of, of the breakdown of the radical universalist tradition and the triumph of centrist notions of identity is the embrace of white identity. It has become a means of rebranding racism in identitarian terms. I'm not racist, I'm just the profoundly my white identity. Over the past half century, class, like so many other social relations, has become reframed, not as a political, but as a cultural, even racial attribute, hence the notion of the white working class, where the whiteness often seems to matter a lot more than the class location. It's a development that's opened the door to the identity movement to the far right, that link a, a reactionary politics of identity rooted in hostility to migrants and Muslims, to economic and social policies that once were the staple of the left, support for the defense of jobs, support for the welfare state, opposition to austerity, so on. And it's helped, in some things, help refashion the, the original reactionary politics of identity for a new age. At the same time, many far right tropes, such as the Great Replacement, which is, uh, as you may know, is a conspiracy theory about how the elites are replacing white Europeans and Americans with migrants, and calls to resist the loss of the white homeland have become a move from becoming well, from being something that even 20 years ago you'd have found entirely on, uh, among the far right to becoming common currency in mainstream conservative discussions. People like um, Lionel Schreiber, the, the novelist, uh, is, a, is, is, is a good proponent, is, 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 a, is an important proponent here uh, in Douglas Murray, he, 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 he's an um, ed, uh, associate editor and spectator, one of the most important uh, conservative voices in America, continually makes uh, such arguments. And here, of course, you have um, many within the Republican Party, within um, the alt right, too, who make similar kinds of uh, claims. The irony is that conservative critics of identity politics are also often those bemoaning white decline and disparaging immigration as sullying the white homeland. The mainstreaming of identity politics has allowed conservatives to give racism a new legitimacy by normalizing white identity, while at the, sa at the same time criticizing the very politics they are embracing. So just to sum up what I've been saying, I think I've already made the time, the most cogent, far-reaching challenge to racial ideas over the past two centuries has been through 
the radical universalist tradition. A tradition that included such disparate and politically distinct figures as Frederick Douglass, uh, W.D. Du Bois, uh, Sylvia Pankhurst, and C.L.R. James, Pauline Murray, and James Baldwin. A tradition that challenged both racism and racialization, that is, both the practice of discrimination and the imposition of racial categories on people often as a, as a means of justifying such discrimination. And the erosion of that tradition has allowed for the, um, the, the re-emergence uh, both of uh, ideas of race re-inscribed in identitarian terms, and more broadly, the space for what we now call identity politics. And it's left us in a, in, in, in a very paradoxical place. We live in an age in which most, in most societies there's a moral abhorrence of racism, albeit that in most, bigotry and discrimination still keeps bigger the lives of many. We also live in an age obsessed by the placing of people into racial and ethnic boxes and to defining everything from policy to moral judgment according to the boxes into which people have been put. And it's as if the more we despise racial thinking, the more we cling to it um, in, a, in a paradoxical way. And that's the paradox, it seems to me, that we need to address if we're to move forward. And to address it, we need to recover that sense of radical universalism, not in the old form, but a new form that speaks to our age. I think I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, there's a lot in there, and um, I'm almost uh, I lost where to start, but one thing I, 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 I was taken with your sort of definition, which I've seen now emerge more and more, right, of that, um, I think we phrased it, uh, race, is, race does not give birth to racism, racism gave birth to race. Um, and the first person I know who, who said this was Hannah Arendt, actually, um, in, in Origins of Totalitarianism, uh, where she argues that, um, uh, and distinguishes what she calls Jew hatred from anti-Semitism, says that racism is actually an ideological justification for prejudice and difference. It's not a hatred of Jews itself. The person who's made this really famous recently is Ibram X. Kennedy, right, who also says that um, race uh, um, doesn't give birth to race, but race doesn't give birth to race. Um, and for him, though, um, uh, you know, he draws a very different conclusion, which we have to fight. Um, since it's racism is thing we have in us, because we all justify differences, we have to fight ourselves constantly. I mean, we're all racist, but undo our racism, which is a never-ending struggle. Um, it seems to me that you read this slightly differently from both of them, which is almost to, you know, to resist this rise of pessimism, loss of radical universalism, and you say we need to recover a radical universalism. I guess I, I want to know is, how does this redefinition of race, so that race doesn't give birth to racism, race doesn't give birth to race, which is now, it seems like, is, is everywhere in the air. But how does that fit, and how is that important to your understanding of racism as a well, whole? I actually used Hannah Arendt's um, arguments about um, anti-Semitism mm -hmm. to make my own arguments about the, the distinction between true hatred in the, in the, in the uh, pre-modern world yeah. and the emergence of a new form I mean, the, the, the other person who, um, contemporary person who, who um, argues this um, very strongly, um, and his work should be read by far more than uh, is, is Barbara Fields. Yeah. Um, the uh, teacher of all first year students. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, I mean, race craft is made one of the women's. This is a very important book I think, to read. And what it means to me is, I mean, I, I kind of developed, started thinking about this um, a long time ago. Because I wanted to try and understand races, race and racism in, in a modern world in more materialist terms, not, not, not to say purely in, in terms of psychological dispositions or, or, or kind of, kind of inner, inner uh, sense that we have. And to understand in, in, in more materialist terms how ideas of racial categorization became so important. And it became important because it was a, a means of justifying social practice. Yeah. So that, for me, what's important is, is actually to root out that social practice, but also to see that social practice as part of a much broader um, uh, set of legitimizations for, um, for, uh, for, for um, uh, uh, justifications. And I was having this, uh, something of this debate yesterday about, um, uh, I was having a discussion at the uh, University of uh, uh, Illinois in Chicago, um, with making the point, um, we're talking about the meaning of blackness uh, and, and, and the, the category of blackness. As, and um, to make the point that if you look at something like the, the origins of Jim Crow. There's a tendency to see Jim Crow as somehow the, the imposition of uh, whiteness and, 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 uh, and somebody coming out of a kind of whiteness and, and, and the hatred of blackness. But if you actually look at the, the, the origins of Jim Crow, it's very different. It, it emerges at a point where um, Poor white, specifically poor white farmers, and those fighting for black rights in the, in the post reconstruction period uh, had forged an alliance, yeah. fusion movements in, in, in the South. And an alliance that um, challenged the, the, the elite, the Democrats, in, in, in the North Carolina, and pushed them out in, 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 in various states uh, in the 18th the early 1890s. Um, and it was, a, it was an attempt to break that coalition um, that led the Democrats in the, in the 1890s to both at a level of propaganda and as a level of social practice in terms of creating an apartheid um, uh, state in the states in the South. Um, the, um, that letter, in other words, the rise of Jim Crow cannot be understood in, in simply terms of whiteness and blackness. It can, be, it can be only understood in terms of the material needs of an elite trying to defend its interests against those challenging it. Um, and using racism as a means of breaking that. that, 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 that. And, but also, if you look at, for instance, at disenfranchisement in the post-reconstruction world. We think about disenfranchisement primarily and solely as the disenfranchisement or attempt to disenfranchise um, African Americans. Yeah. Um, who, who, who turned out to be better. But if you look at a lot of the discussions about the laws that came in in places like Mississippi, um, um, it was as much about how to disenfranchise uh, poor whites as it was about disenfranchising um, uh, African Americans, because they too would be seen as, as um, not suitable um, uh, to possess power. So, in many ways, it's kind of what, what we're talking about is, is, is the attempt to legitimize and justify the maintenance of power by the elites and the use of racial category and of racism as a means of, of, of sustaining that power. Um, and that is, is, to me, hugely important because um, 
because unless we understand um, racism in that kind of broader context, I think so we will never will understand racism. Thank you. Um, take open questions. Um, Thank you, Ken. That was really interesting. Um, yeah, I have just one question. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about. So, you know, I was I thought it was very interesting. I agree. Most of your points, the history of racism. But you stop your talk with uh, we have to recover radical universalism, and I was just wondering coming up. Speak about Enlightenment and the 19th century. Could you speak a little bit more about what that means for us in the present and into the future? Sure. I know that the subtitle of your book is The History, so it makes sense that you go back. <coughs> but sure. um, to kind of like get out of what you were talking about, that pessimistic view, as a student here at Bard, living in, how can we do that? Well, in, in, in a sense, um, it's not for me to say because these because it, it comes out of these kinds of movements come out of struggles, and it is in those struggles that, that we will forge um, new forms of thinking about how we relate to each other and how what kind of societies we want because that's really what we're talking about. And part of the problem is that it is our, it, there is a kind of disaffection about the possibilities of those, that kind of radical change that has um, um, driven the kind of politics that, that, that I'm arguing against. Um, so it, it may be better to, to look rather than say, what kind of politics do we need? Uh, and I, I'd say you know, the kind of politics is, um, for, for me, for instance, the, the, the debate about integration is, is, is particularly important in the current period, precisely because that is the, 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 um, the argument, um, the, 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 the issue that is used to create divisions within societies and to say that um, uh, poor housing or lack of wages um, uh, is to do with migrants and not to do with social policy, and therefore unless we tackle the question of um, immigration. And, and, and this is not just in America, it's not just in Europe. You can see the same in South Africa, for example. You can see the same in India, uh, that same process, and that's why it becomes so important. Um, but if, if, if we look at a, a, a specific issue, it is, it's not it's not so much me saying what um, a radical universalist position means. It means to say what not possessing one, and, and to look at, look at issues more in racial or identitarian terms, um, creates a problem. The question of mass incarceration in, 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 in America. Uh, um, there's, a, there's, there's a kind of widespread belief that mass incarceration is uh, the product of racism. To some it's the, it's the, um, it's a new Jim Crow in this example. And there's, it's unquestionably African Americans have disproportionately suffered from, from, from um, mass incarceration. But ironically, paradoxically, it's not because the, the, the cause, the force, the, the source of mass incarceration is racism. If you look at um, mass incarceration in terms, in the, not in overall terms, but in terms of income levels, at every income level, the incarceration rates of blacks and whites are almost the same. Not quite, but they're almost the same. The huge difference, as you would expect, it's across income levels that it's those who have or are low income or poor or working class are far more likely to be incarcerated than those who are wealthy or higher income. And someone who is, uh, and, and, and the biggest um, difference is between those who are high school dropouts and college graduates. 
And that has nothing to do with race, it's irrespective of race. A high school dropout, a white high school dropout, is 15 times more likely to be incarcerated, uh, I think I've got the figure for the than a African American college graduate. In other words, what, what we're talking about is not it, it, it's, it's a problem not created by race itself or race of itself. The reason why African Americans are disproportionately um, affected by mass incarceration is because they are disproportionately working class and poor. Now, the reason they're disproportionately working class and poor is, of course, to do with racism, or a large part of it is to do with racism. But the problem of mass incarceration is not to do with racism as such. It's to do with the militarized policing of poor and working class areas and the attempt to contain those areas. And the reason that's important is that if we look at it kind of narrowly in identitarian or, 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 or racial terms, see this across the race term, we will never understand where it comes from and therefore we'll never be able to challenge um, what. Uh, the, 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 the pernicious character of mass incarceration. Um, and that affects African Americans even more than it affects white people, simply because they're disproportionately affected by, by the process. So paradoxically, to defend African Americans better from the, the, problem, the issue of, of um, of uh, mass incarceration, we need to look at not at the question of race, but the question, actually, in this case, of class. I mean, there's always a class, class but, but it happens to be, in this case, the issue is that of class and, and of the way that um, low income or working class people are treated. And it's in that process. Of seeing that, I mean, or, or, take something, or even take something like um, police killings. I mean, uh, people are often shocked by the fact that 50% of those killed by the police are white um, because we have it in our heads. I mean, it, it's, it's disproportionate. That African American is disproportionately more likely to be, to be killed by the police, two or three times more likely. But it's not. But, but, it's a broader issue than simply that of race. Um, again, if you look at, I mean, figures are, are less clear here because they're, 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 um, they've been collected less. But again, if you look at um, what are the best markers for the likelihood of police brutality and police killings, it's not race, it is um, geography and location. Um, and those areas with low income greater proportion of low income uh, families and low income populations are, again, as we would expect, much more likely to face police brutality and police killing uh, than those areas with, uh, that, that, are, that are rich and, uh, and wealthier. So the point I'm trying to make is that the way we look at these issues, the categories we use uh, to understand the world, often um, undermine our possibilities, both of understanding those, that, those issues, but also building uh, coalitions um, that can uh, challenge those issues. Because if, 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 we, if we see the problem as simply that of race, and the, and the problem largely that of Afri African Americans facing mass incarceration or, or um, uh, police brutality, then we miss out kind of the wider picture. And it is in addressing that wider picture, I think, that we begin to, to build the kinds of movements that, that I've been talking about. Um, that we begin to have a more, uh, uh, it's out of those, those kind of wider, broader struggles that we begin to think about issues in, in, in radical universities terms. I don't know if that answers what, what, what you think. But yeah. 
I think I, I would just not um, clearly distinguish race and class in the way it sounds like to you they are very separated. Well, for me, it's like more there. There's an overlap, right? Um, they like it. It is not. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. No. Go ahead. Go ahead. It's not so much just an overlap as or the, as, as one class. thing follows out of the other, and so of course, uh, race is class. And well, race is not class because 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 there, there are um, uh, the in the in the days of Jim Crow, you, the, the the class locations of most African Americans were very similar to you because uh, there was a very small. Or almost negligible uh, black middle class. Today, that's not the case, and therefore, the difference between the the, the, the um, working class African Americans and middle class elite African Americans is important to take into account, and that's why it's not just simply a question of race and class overlapping. It is about class actually. Um, creating divisions within those communities. And it's not just African American communities. I mean, one of the things that, that um, strikes me, um, and this is probably more true in Britain even than in America, is that we think about minorities as belonging almost to classless communities. And class becomes something that's applied primarily to, um, to, to the white population. You know, hence, the white working class has become almost like a a necessary adjective you, you put before working class. And so um, questions of class, well, when you raise questions of class, people always um, accuse you of being class reductionist. Well, I'd say, I'd say, I'd turn it on its head. Given that the majority of African Americans and, most, and many other minority groups are poor and working class, not to address the issues of class uh, head on, and not to see that it is in addressing those that we actually begin to, to, to challenge questions of racism, is to ignore the experiences and aspirations and needs of the majority of those who live in minority communities, um, and, to, and to, to accede to the needs largely of the middle class and the elites in those communities. I think that, that, that seems to me a major problem. There's a really great analogy with the Jews in the mid 20, early mid 20, early 20th century, right? The, the wealthier Germanized Jews preferred to get privileges to, um, to, 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 to work into a similar society rather than have equality for also the Eastern European Jews yeah. in, in Europe. I mean, it's a similar thing, I think. Really, really I mean, you, 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 I mean, it's, it's still the same. Yeah. I mean, in Israel too, that, 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 that's the case. Uh, yeah. uh, okay, can I win? John, do you have a question? I do. Okay, we'll do. John and Caitlin, can we take two questions? And then, so yeah, sure. one, one by one. That's fine, that's fine. John and Caitlin. Let me write this down. Okay, I'm like taken by the idea of radical universalism mostly as a way to build movements of solidarity and collectivism. Um, but I'm also really wary of the way that universe, universalism can be simplified to a sort of assimilation. So, so like how Eastern Europeans sort of assimilate into waspy American culture rather than building solidarity movements with other immigrant groups, other non-waspy American groups. And so I guess I'm wondering if there's a way to reconcile those things that because I think that when I think of modern day identity politics, part of it is trying to make the argument that marginalized groups don't have to assimilate into the dominant culture to whether that's like generate wealth or otherwise move up the sort of metaphor. Sure. Do you want to answer that? Sure. No, no. I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I, we, well, however you want we to go over and then we'll do it. Okay. Um, I think I think I think that they're, they're, they're kind of we we need to unpick both what we mean by universalism and what we mean by assimilationism. I mean they're kind of um, when it comes to universalism, as I said, there are different um, 
forms of universalism. Um, uh, and, and part of the problem is that the, the, the liberal universalist tradition has always sought to make universal less universal. Um, but there is, and, and assimilationism, again, there are kind of two ways you can, one can think about this. One can imagine um, uh, assimilationism in terms of um, you give up uh, all your uh, what what you see as your culture, your your your, your sense of belonging, and so on, um, and become part of um, what is seen as you know mainstream culture, majority culture. Or we can see it as saying that we don't. In, um, in the way that the state relates to um, those from minority communities, we do not take into account the fact that your, 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 your racial history um, uh, as, a, a, as a way of treating you as a citizen. The bad way of, 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 of assimilation, as you can see in France, it's in France because assimilationism in France is, is, is a means of pointing up the, the differences of those who are deemed not to belong to the French nation uh, because they can't be, they're not part of the uh, French Republican tradition. Um, um, and so that they, they are, um, interestingly, in, 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 the, in the perception of, of French assimilationists, they are. In, in, they're not incapable of assimilating into France. Um, they are forever tainted by their difference, as it were. And the 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 the, 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 the insistence on, 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 on French authorities that we don't take race into account is really. A, a, and insistence that we don't take racism into account. Um, and so the, the idea that, that you know, we ignore the question of race becomes we ignore the question of racism that exists in, in society. Um, uh, and in particular, the way that the, 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 um, the, the state treats them. So the question, I think, is this that. that we think of ourselves as belonging to particular communities. The trouble is that those communities are as diverse as the societies in which those communities exist. One of the problems with the way we think about diversity is that we think about societies as diverse, but we think about minority communities always as homogenous. Um, and so there are um, you, you might recall there was a, 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 a controversy in, um, in America earlier this year at uh, Hamline University about the showing of um, a, an image of uh, Muhammad uh, during a, a, a class on um, Islamic art history. Um, I'm always, one of the interesting things that, 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 that struck me about that was that the, the instructor was effectively sacked, and there was a bit of controversy about it. And the, the university accepted, as, it, as, as, as the reason for that, is accepted that um, Muslims um, do not forbid the representation of, of Muhammad. But I wonder if, if they actually ask themselves, if that is true, how come there are images of Muhammad from within Islamic art to show to students. In other words, it is not the case that Muslims, all Muslims, have um, uh, abhorred the, 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 uh, the depiction of Muhammad. Um, it is certainly that there are many traditions, particularly within um, Persian, Indian, Turkish um, forms of Islam. Um, which have been quite happy to be quite open about depicting uh, Muhammad and, 
and you know, you, you, there are mosques in, in Iran that, that have that, such depictions. The, uh, the, the forbidding of, 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 of Islam, of, of, of depictions, is, is a, is a uh, Sunni tradition primarily, and, and a relatively modern one. But the point, about, the point I'm trying to make here is that the Islamic tradition, there are many Islamic traditions, there is no single Islamic community with a single view of what it is to, um, uh, what is, uh, is not um, allowed to be depicted. But because we take certain people who are usually the, the more, more conservative figures within those communities as being authentically of that community and speaking for that community, we, we then assume a kind of homogeneity to the Muslim community, as the Muslim community. Um, there's a Danish um, MP called Nasser Hadda, who's um, Muslim, a secular Muslim. And he, he tells her this conversation he had with um, a local journalist, um, that the editor of, 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 a, of a Danish newspaper called Politica, which is a, you know, the, 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 an important local newspaper in general. And his editor told him all Muslims are um, hostile to the Danish cartoons. This is just around the time of, of, of the controversy of the Danish cartoons, 2006. And Nasser Hadda said, uh, I'm not uh, uh, hostile to it. To which the editor replied, but you're not a proper Muslim. <laughs> in other words, being a proper Muslim is defined by being hostile to those things, by being um, uh, uh, conservative, by being reactionary almost. And if you're not, somehow you are not, you're not authentically part of that, that community. And it seems to me that's the problem. The problem is that um, we, we tend to think about um, Uh, about, about communities, when it comes to minority communities, in a very different way than the way we think about majority communities. We, we, we never, we'd never make that kind of assumption about majority communities, and yet we make that assumption about minority communities. And we impose about minority communities certain ways of, of looking at them and their world, and, and, and as if they have only have certain ways of looking at the world. And so it seems to me that, going back to your question about universalism and, and, and assimilationism, what we're really talking about is to acknowledge that, that there is no single way that minorities from any community relate to, that, to, to, to the wider society. Nor is there a single way that that wider society relates to those minority communities. And it is in seeing that there are single ways that the problem arises. A universalist perspective would seem to me to say that, um, that, these, that what matters um, are in the struggles, are the struggles themselves and, and, and our capacity to be able to, to and, and our desire to insist that, that people, whatever their background, whatever their um, uh, affiliations, uh, whatever their, their, their views on uh, the controversial uh, as the, the issues at the moment, have the right to the same, uh, or what have, uh, should be treated with the same rights and dignities. Um, and it is, in, it, 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 it is in that that we begin to, to build um, a useful force of solidarity. Solidarity that, that's not based on um, ideas about uh, identities or, or, or belonging. Um, that, that are often very pernicious. Because this idea about who is an authentic, mem who is an authentic Muslim is where the liberal left meets the bigoted right. Because it's the bigoted 
is innate, is things are reactionary. He's saying all Muslims are reactionary. And in a, in a funny way, the liberal left has come to accept that and, 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 and to organize um, its policies around that and, and its attitudes around that. So it seems to me that, that what we need to get away from is this idea that there is this single view that minorities have or this single relationship to um, wider societies that minorities possess. And to treat minorities um, uh, and to treat individuals from minorities as citizens with, a, with different views in the same ways as, as those from majority communities do. Or the way we treat um, uh, individuals from majority communities. Thank you. John? Yes, no, thank you. Um, good evening. <laughs> um, I want to ask a question about the evolution of your own thought. You've been thinking about these things for a long time. And to some extent, I've lived through the same times as you in, indeed, the same country um, as a member of the provincial middle class community, um, as well. Um, you, you said in one of your books that the Rushdie affair was a watershed for you, a watershed in the transition from, if I'm not putting it too crudely, from um, anti-racism to anti-multiculturalism. And to some extent, these are the things you've been talking about this evening. Um, um, and this was a transformative time, of course, for many of us thinking about these things from different angles. Since then, have you changed your views about anything? Well, because at that time, if I remember rightly, you drew a comparison between the racial discourse and racial policy in the UK and the US, which was definitely favored the US model or US practice. Um, now, I mean, things change, events happen, you know, discourse is transformed. Is there any event since then, or set of events, that has caused you to change your thinking or evolve your thinking further in the way that you did at that sure. time? I, I, to begin with, let uh, uh, me make clear two things. Firstly, um, the argument I, I, I've made for a long time is that there's a distinction to be drawn between diversity as lived experience and multiculturalism as a political process. Mm -hmm. And that we, the problem with, with, our, with debates about multiculturalism is that they confuse the two. Diversity as lived experience is a good. I'm for mass immigration. I'm for um, the, 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 the creation of a more cosmopolitan, more open society. But at the same time, what, what, what societies do is try and manage that diversity by putting people into, as we were talking about before, into racial and ethnic and cultural boxes and defining policies and needs and, uh, and aspirations by the boxes into which people are put. That's the problem. And the problem is that that process of, of, of multiculturalism as a political process attempts to manage diversity, actually undermines much of what is good about diversity itself. I mean, the point about diversity is that um, it allows us to expand our horizons, to, 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 um, to discuss debate with people with different values and beliefs and lifestyles and so on. Uh, and in that, to create a more common, more universal language of, of citizenship, or more universal language of belonging, certainly. Um, so that's the first thing. The, the second thing um, is that I forgot what, what was the second point you were making, which I wanted to, uh, which I wanted to take up. Um, oh yes, um, I, I wouldn't have said that America was, was a better example um, than, than Britain. I would. Um, there are certain aspects of American um, culture, <coughs> American politics that. that that uh, are uh, useful and important to understand, and then it's, it, there's this kind of, you know, this kind of dismissal of, of, of American culture and American uh, attitudes to race, it, it, um, which is what I, I, I'd oppose. And um, have have things happened? Well, lots of things have happened since since, since that time, um, but broadly, I think us us. Still accept us uh, still um, argue for the same kinds of um, uh, 
from the same standpoint, which is that the starting point of, um, of the attempt to create a, 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 a better society must be the acceptance of individuals, whatever their racial, cultural, or ethnic background, as having the same set of rights, duties, and obligations as anybody else, um, and not to uh, insist, or oh, not, not, not to not, not to try and uh, argue that different groups have different sets of um, needs and um, as a group have different sets of needs and aspirations um, and not just needs and aspirations but rights as well so in that sense um, I would maintain what, what I argued from the beginning um, well, from the beginning for, for, for the last 30 years I mean, the reason I say the, the, I wrote that the, the Rushkey Affair was a watershed was that it kind of um, brought together or, or, or expressed a set of developments that was already happening, which was the shift from, of the left from a more universalist or more particularist position. I lost a lot of friends over, over the Rushkey Affair. I think they're still... Um, thought Rushdie was wrong and, and his book should be banned. Uh, because they thought it necessary to defend the dignity of the Muslim community um, to do that. Um, and my view is that um, there are plenty of people within Muslim communities who don't think that at all. That this is not a Muslim view. It's, it's, it's the, the view of a particular group within Muslim communities. So that... Um, For me, it, 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 it was kind of central. It, it made me rethink ideas about um, multiculturalism, free speech, um, those kinds of issues that have become dominant in the Islamism, um, terrorism, those kinds of issues, which I hadn't really um, engaged with previously, but now became uh, uh, central to, to my viewpoint. Um, and it, and, it, and it kind of di differentiated the, my view of what it is to be on the left from what the left was becoming. Um, and I think, you know, we can have a debate about that, but it, it, it's, it's, it's become a, a major debate today, of course. Um, but this was a kind of very early uh, perception of that, or very early instance of that, and forcing me to, to think of those issues. Thank you. I think we need to um, to wrap it up and head to dinner. Thank you very much. <laughs>